Welcome, Stephen. It's so great to see you again. Well, it's lovely to see you, Mark. We've not met for years, and it's, it's a great pleasure to see you. Me too. So I'd like to begin by talking about your own path and the importance of rebelliousness on your own path. How has that defined your own maturation as a practitioner? Well, first of all, I, I, I fully understand what you say, and I know that I'm often considered to be a rebel, and I'm even conscious of the fact that I value transgression. But on the other hand, I feel that the things that I have done that are called transgressive are, from my point of view, simply my own way of most honestly and most cogently articulating what I've learned from these traditions. And what I find is that the problem is not with the traditions. The problem lies really with certain fixed orthodox beliefs and views that somehow get over time become kind of fossilized mm. and um, often contradict the deeper teachings and values that the tradition seeks to embody. So, for example, when I was training as a Tibetan Buddhist monk in a very conservative tradition, the Geluk school of Tibetan Buddhism, I was encouraged to question everything, to not just take things on faith, but to really find my own understanding. That's what I was taught to do. But I recognize in hindsight that that wasn't quite what was meant. What was meant was that you would inquire deeply into this tradition, and if you did so, then you're bound to come up with the same views that the tradition holds. If you don't, it means that you haven't done enough inquiry, as it were. It's a sort of a catch-22. And I feel that's been the case in much of my uh, journey mm. through the Buddhist tradition, which is the one I'm really most rooted in, is that I feel I'm not being transgressive at all. I feel I'm actually being truthful to the deeper origins and sources of the very tradition itself. It's the tradition, I think, that tends to get itself stuck, both in orthodox opinions, which are all invariably linked into questions of institutional power. You can't separate those two. And once that marriage is made, then it becomes extremely difficult for any individual practitioner uh, to follow a way that is a genuine, heartfelt expression of their own practice. You feel that to be part of the Sangha, the community, right. you have to conform. And right. if you cease to conform, then you are rejected. So what I found in all of my journey, really, with the Tibetan Buddhists and then with the Zen Buddhists and then with the Vipassana and the Theravada people, with Buddhism on the whole, I constantly find myself going back as deep as I can into the roots of the tradition, discovering things there which often have been forgotten by orthodoxy. Mm. And when I try to articulate and to present these ideas in my own voice, then all hell breaks loose. Right, right which seems so uh, ironic in Buddhism, which is based on being a lamp unto yourself, killing the Buddha if you meet him in the road. And yet, as you say, it's rejected. And, and you, you are, you're kind of a lightning rod for a lot of for Buddhists in particular around this question of obedience and being faithful and what being yeah. faithful means. Do you find yourself catching a lot of flack for your views? Well, it's not, maybe it's not too surprising to discover that Buddhists are very good at passive aggression. <laughs> and, uh, as, a, as a result, um, my Buddhist friends and the Buddhist community as a whole is a genuinely made up of very well meaning, good hearted people. Mm. And they don't like criticizing others, at least in public. And so you don't get. I don't get an awful lot of flack from uh, people, at least that I'm in contact with. It's sometimes I, I, one image that comes to mind is that the response to a lot of my work is like the silent closing of doors. In other words, it's about exclusion. In other words, it, it's an unstated exclusion. I find myself just not really welcome in many Buddhist forums. Um, but I'm never told to my face by these people that they don't want me. It's just that it doesn't happen. 
I do get flack and apparently people, I was talking to someone on a retreat a few weeks ago and he'd, he'd read something I'd written, he'd come on the retreat and then he told me, he said, you know, if you go on the internet and you look for stuff on you, he said, it's a shit storm out there. Now, I'm not aware of that because I don't Google Stephen Batchelor and see what people are saying about him. I have no interest whatsoever <laughs> right. in people's opinions on that regard. But I think the positive side uh, which I like to give more attention to is the fact that by speaking out, I find that I'm actually voicing other people's own frustrations and doubts and fears. And I seem to, in a way, validate things that people feel deep down in themselves to be, to be true, but they don't find an affirmation coming from their, their sangha or their community or their religion. And so I'm, serving in that sense as a kind of person who stands as an example perhaps to take a stand yourself to find your own voice to me that is so absolutely essential in this practice and you're quite right be a lamp unto yourself say the buddhist text mm. but in practice it doesn't usually work out like that and um mm -hmm. yeah. Yeah. Uh, there are exceptions of course and, and i don't want to sort of this Buddhism because oh, yeah. there's an awful lot of good in it. And I think even people I disagree with, I still respect enormously. Mm -hmm. But it's true. I think as Dharma, Buddhism tries to find its voice in an entirely new situation, the modern world, right. of course it's going to clash with certain ancient beliefs and views of how things are. Of course, it's going to clash with certain structures of power who are invested in holding on to certain views. So it's hardly surprising. And I think it's actually a very healthy thing that we can have a community that can include people like myself, as well as, you know, those who are very contented with the Orthodox tradition. I, I don't feel myself to be at war with anybody. I just think it's a question of integrity and honesty. Mm, absolutely. I can remember reading Buddhism Without Beliefs 20 plus years ago and being so relieved that somebody was saying what I have always felt about the practice. You know, someone who loves the essential core of it, but hasn't lost sight of the individuality and the importance of making it our own. Exactly. There is not a lot of space for that in some Buddhist circles. That is absolutely right. And, and that I think is the key the very key point is to make it one's own. And, and weirdly, you find that expression in the Pali texts. Mm. The, 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 the Buddha says that the person who has entered the stream of the path is someone who has made the path their own. Wow. Exactly the words he uses. Wow. He, he talks of entering the stream as becoming independent of others in your practice. Right. It's all there in the text. But you don't find a lot of contemporary traditional Buddhist teachers citing those texts. You have to go back to sort of uncover what's been sort of covered over and buried. Right. And I, I suspect that's true in, in, in many traditions. I know it's true in Christianity. Of course, of course. In fact, I've been very inspired in my work by the examples of radical Christian thinkers and theologians who, who've done a very similar kind of thing. They've given me the courage mm. to do what I do. Mm. And I'm sure that's true in, in, the, in, the, in the Islamic tradition and the Judaic traditions too. I'm less familiar with that, so I can't really say. But yeah. um, I think it's the lifeblood of a living tradition. Mm. A, a living tradition is one that can't just keep repeating the same things. That's not what a tradition is about. A tradition is about maintaining a, a, a live conversation with your own past as a tradition. It's constantly about renewal. And that means in any new generation about finding one's own voice, about somehow becoming uh, one's own teacher in many ways. Mm. Well, you've sort of answered my next question, but uh, mm -hmm. begun to answer it. But could you say something more about the importance of standing alone in spiritual life, the importance of being willing to break rules? Well, I understand spiritual life or not about achieving some preconceived idea of what it means to be enlightened, not about sort of fitting oneself, forcing oneself sometimes into a position uh, in which you'll be recognized and honored and accepted within your community. And then you can just repeat, repeat, repeat down the generation. Mm 
but it's rather more about uh, really finding out who you really are and honoring that uniqueness of individuality in all members of your community. To me, a community, a, a living spiritual community, is one in which groups of individual men and women come together in order to help each other become more truly who they are in themselves. It's not a spirit, a living community, if the a name of the game is basically to get everybody to agree on everything, everybody to have the same boringly predictable answer to all the same questions. Um, that to me is, is dead. It's, that is, is not a living community at all anymore. It's, it's about preserving things. And as soon as the word preservation of the Dharma comes into play, we're basically in the business of, uh, of pickling. Uh, the only things we preserve are things that are already dead. Uh, and um, uh, Buddhism and probably all traditions constantly face that danger. Mm, right. Beautiful. So let's turn now to solitude, which is the subject of your new book. Uh, you quote uh, De Quincey uh, as, as referring to that inner world of secret self-consciousness in which each of us lives a second life apart and within himself alone. Uh, how do you recommend that we begin to cultivate that inner world, that, that um, affinity and comfort uh, with solitude? Well, first of all, I think we have to recognize that that is part of who we are. Uh, that solitude is not a privilege for the spiritual. It's part of our existential condition. Uh, we are born alone and we die alone, as Shantideva and many as Seneca, I found the same quote in him the other day. Uh, the, the being alone is part of our existential condition. But what is paradoxical about that is that being with other people is also part of our existential condition. We are alone with others. And in fact, my first self-penned book was called precisely that. And I was very much struck by how these two apparently contradictory dimensions, participation and solitude, are inseparable. This to me is a, the deep paradox of spiritual life, is to recognize that we're not at war with ourselves. We don't have two incompatible sides that somehow have to coexist. But actually our being alone is also already a condition which is embedded in a world. And our being embedded in a world is also a condition in which we're alone. And it's how these two dimensions of our being somehow work together that constitutes for me the core of, of spiritual life. I was certainly not trying to suggest that the true spiritual life is what's going on deep inside me. Mm. Uh, that's only half the story at best. But a genuine spiritual life is one where you've come to some integration of an inwardness, as Kierkegaard spoke of and others, at the same time as a dynamic participation in the social framework within which you live. So the first point is to start to recognize that. And I think a lot of people who are intuitively drawn to a contemplative tradition probably are already quite introspective or introverted people. Th this interests them. They're, they're curious about our inwardness, this, this strange capacity we have to have a part of ourselves that we really cannot ever share with anybody else. Mm -hmm. And I remember when I was uh, at school, uh, probably was seven or eight years old, I was always struck by how the, all of the teachers would talk about anything except what's actually going on inside us, our worries, our fears, our anxieties, our longings. Our... This was something that was taboo in Western education. Mm -hmm. uh, and that struck me at a very young age, and that struck me as something very weird, uh, that an education could actually ignore the very thing that is, matters most to us. In other words, how we feel, how we are, mm. who we are. Mm. So what attracted me in Buddhism uh, was to meet with you know, Tibetan lamas uh, in the first instance who had no embarrassment about it. They had no reserve or, or feeling awkward about talking about deeply interior qualities of being. And I think that was an enormous attraction to me. 
Uh, these, for the first time, I'd met people who are completely open about talking around these things, and not only talking about them, actually providing exercises and practices and disciplines that enabled you to refine your interiority. And in some ways, I think that's what meditation is all about. Meditation is about cultivating and stabilizing and clarifying uh, your own uh, inward spaciousness. And what the Buddhist and, and Hindu and other traditions are, are so good at is that they have developed methodologies and ways of being that over time you can train and you can become more true to yourself, meaning that you become less the victim of your random thoughts and fears and emotions and memories and plans, and you stabilize an inner attentiveness or mindfulness. Uh, that then more and more becomes the center of how you live, not just with regard to yourself, but just as equally, maybe even more, in the relations you then uh, engage with with others. Mm -hmm. So that's, I hope that answers, yeah. that begins to address your question. Yeah, beautifully, beautifully. I'd like to move now to the question of the wholesomeness of solitude. You talk about a middle ground of solitude as a site of autonomy, wonder, contemplation, imagination, inspiration, and care, while making the important point that not all solitude is wholesome. What do you mean by that? Well, I think solitude is a term that embraces a wide range of human experience from the despair of loneliness, for example, which I think is very much a, 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 you know, an issue in our time. People uh, suffer from their aloneness. They suffer from their solitude. I've also found out, for example, in, except in English, most other European languages, the word solitude is, is almost entirely negative. In French, la solitude means loneliness. They don't have a separate word for loneliness. Oh. A German, einsamkeit. Again, loneliness, that's the, the connotation. In, in English, we're very fortunate in having a clear differentiation between solitude, which is broadly neutral, I think, whereas loneliness, which is you know, lar largely something to be you know, not valued. Um, so I try to present solitude in the terms that you say. In other words, I see it as a site of autonomy and care and so forth and so on. But to do that, you have to learn how to live in solitude. You have to somehow you know, come to terms with your aloneness and to be open to the fact that it does have a shadow side. It has a shadow side of loneliness, of alienation. Uh, and I think modernity, uh, with our, you know, these big cities in which we live and in, in a working world where very few people are actually from the place where you're working, but especially in the United States, people travel all over the place. There's very little sense of, of being rooted and grounded in a community over generations. People are very much on their own. And this causes an enormous amount of, of suffering and pain, just that fact of being feeling disconnected and cut off. Mm. So that's the, 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 I wouldn't say unwholesome so much, but rather as the, the negative or the dark or the shadow side of solitude. But clearly, if we are to come to terms with our solitude, we have to come to terms with that as well. Mm. Um, it, it wouldn't be much point just to va valorizing the nice bits. We have to take on board that if we embark on a, on a life of, of inwardness, we're also going to be encountering dark nights of the soul. Mm. Uh, we're going, and I think the dark night of the soul is very much about that, that, uh, that, uh, you know, that challenging and threatening and destabilizing, overwhelming sense of what it is to be alone. Mm. Uh, and I think contemplative practices, also certain philo philosophical traditions, and as I mentioned in the book, also the use of certain uh, uh, psychedelics and so on can help us, I think, ground ourselves in our solitude in a much more healthy way, which will perhaps help us to, you know, be more at ease with being alone, with being cut off, with being isolated in some way. Mm -hmm. uh, but of course, the existentially, uh, we're all going to die and we're all going to get old and get sick. And these things are going to ultimately be faced by us and us alone. Mm. Uh, and that, I think, is very central to the practice of 
these contemplative trainings is that we learn to live with the, the dukkha, uh, the pain of being human, uh, and to have the capacity to do that instead of, you know, sort of switching our minds off or getting distracted or you know, taking opiates or whatever. Right, right, right. Attachment is another thorny issue in spiritual life. And of course, it has a lot to do with solitude and whether, we're, whether we enjoy it or don't enjoy it. Or, uh, you talk about Montaigne says, of course, we should have wives, children, possessions, and above all health, but not to become attached to them in such a way that our happiness depends on them. Let these things be ours, but not so glued and joined to us that we cannot detach ourselves from them without ripping off our own skin in the process. Uh, I, I love that. And it points to, uh, to me, a more balanced attitude to, to human attachment and, and, and love. So how can we as seekers find a middle path between this extreme idea of being detached, whatever that means, uh, and actually being engaged, emotional, interdependent human beings on the planet trying to get on uh, together? Well, I wish I had a simple 25-word answer to that question, but I don't. And I don't think you probably expected one either. I think, I think what we're both, in a way, trying to flag is that uh, to live, uh, to, to, to flourish as a human being, mm. uh, to become wholly human, requires that we embrace all dimensions of our life with equal value. To, to be able to accept the radical aloneness of our existence, mm. and at the same time, the radical participatory nature of our being. And that to live such a life, um, it, and such a life begins to flourish when we're able to somehow bring these two sides together. There's a quote in the book from uh, Emerson, Mm. Where she talked about how you know it's all very well to live in solitude according to the rules of solitude. That's quite easy. It's all very well to live in the world and follow the rules of the world. That's quite easy. The real challenge is to maintain what he calls the sweetness of one's solitude yeah. in the midst of the engagements with the world, and, and that I think is the key. And I think that's also there in Buddhism too. They may not use that sort of language, but I remember one of the things I learned and remembered from my Tibetan Buddhist training was that the Buddha, the awakened one, is someone who has realized their own purpose and also at the same time realized purpose for others, mm -hmm. literally. In other words, that's considered to be the goal, not some deep introspective mystical vision that only you are really access right. to, nor you know, opening up hospitals and working with the poor in Calcutta, which is again a wonderful thing, but it might be a way of escaping who you actually are somehow we've got in our own specific lives uh, in the uniqueness of our own situations to forge a path that brings these two dimensions together mm -hmm. now i think in our society we're not educated in a contemplative tradition we're not given these skills as children mm -hmm. uh, or even as young adults uh, and as a consequence we're very um untrained in living alone we don't get an education as to how to live alone mm -mm. Uh, we need to go to buddhism or maybe psychotherapy can of course help very much in this regard and arguably that's what a lot of psychotherapy is about actually it's coming to terms with inwardness and um but how each one of us pursues this path is going to be unique it's no, there's no recipe but I think it's very important to be clear about the territory within which these practices operate. Mm -hmm. Right, right, right. People can be so judgmental around attachment, particularly emotional oh, attachment attachments in spiritual life. And I, yeah, I, I, well, I, find, I find it very kind of judgmental, limiting, and hypocritical. Yeah, I, attachment is a... Uh, you see, I think at one level, attachment is just... It's a neutral term. We are attached to other people. We're attached to our parents. We're attached to our society. We're attached to all these things. And that is not a value judgment. It's just an acknowledgement that we are beings who live and thrive and can only exist through our attachments to other things. Um, the problem is when the attachment becomes pathological. 
In other words, as Montaigne says, uh, the attachment to my wife and family, for example, is something that I can't do without. It's something that I completely depend upon to feel okay in myself. And if my wife leaves me, my world falls apart. Then your attachment has become something that is used as a prop to keep you feeling okay about who you are, but you're not actually okay about who you are in any self-sufficient way. And the practice of solitude is really the practice of self-sufficiency in many ways, sort of inner self-sufficiency. Your sense of who you are is held up by all kinds of relationships which could break the moment. People might die, you get sick, you move, you have to flee a war, whatever it might be. So it's at those moments that you realize how much your attachments have somehow kept you, prevented you from really living fully Mm. on your own terms. And the flip side of that, which you'll find in monasteries and so on, is that attachment just becomes demonized. Any connection to anything is somehow tying you down to the miserable world of samsara and birth and death and all these things. Whereas in fact, um, that's you've just simply opted for the opposite extreme there. You've exactly. decided instead of being, you know, to- overly dependent on others' approval, you've decided to withdraw yourself from others altogether and try to just live on your own terms. And that's again a form of alienation, I would say, say at some point. Um, uh, I mean, temperamentally, some people are more capable and find it, it easy to do these things than others. We need to acknowledge that. But in the end, once again, we come back to the need for balance. Mm. We need for, for integration, wholeness. That's what it's all about. Right. right. So speaking of integration and wholeness, I'd like to talk now about intoxicants on the spiritual path. I think that this is going to be the most radical part of the book for a lot of people. You're the first well-known Buddhist teacher I know who's been willing to come out this way about your use of intoxicants and how certain substances like ayahuasca and, and, and peyote have helped you. So could you talk a little bit about why they have mattered to you on your path and how people can mindfully engage with them without losing their, um, you know, without losing their balance? Well, this is a this is this is a long story. Um, I think, um, like many of my generation, and I suspect this is also true with you, Mark, is that one of the things in our experience as teenagers that led us in this direction in the first place were uh, were taking things like LSD and uh, smoking can- cannabis and so on. And um, from my perspective, from when I was sixteen or seventeen. The, the world of Eastern spirituality and the world of psychedelics was very much you know, interfused yeah. one with the other. Right. And one of the key works uh, that really moved my life on to this path was Ram Dass's Be Here Now. And of course, Ram Dass has recently died, so maybe we could dedicate this conversation to Ram Dass. I think it's a, it's a very good moment. Now, Ram Dass's work basically was the bridge, I think, for a whole generation of people to move from a rather sort of indulgent uh, use of of drugs and often in a very uncontrolled and unsafe way. Mm. Uh, We don't know what the hell it is in that pill you're you're swallowing. You have no supervision. You have no support at all. It's it's very dangerous. I wouldn't encourage it. But on the other hand, it opens the mind. It it, it leads you to realize there is, you can see and be in the world in a way that's, quite different from that of everyday ordinary consciousness of a middle-class young person from North London. Uh, Of course, that perspective doesn't last, last as long as the effects of the drug will last, but it's not something that many of us then went on to forget. In fact, it was like opening the doors of perception, as it were. For a moment, at least, we had a vision of another way of being in the world, that we don't have to believe the, you know, the impressions and the, and the, and, and the things that we're told and uh, we see and hear, but there is other modalities of consciousness that are available to us and that they have been known to be available for centuries amongst native indigenous peoples, mm-hmm. um, you know, both in South America, in, in, in Asia, as well as within all of these contemplative traditions, particularly in, in India. 
Mm. And remember, in India, if you go to India today, the sadhus are sitting around smoking ganja, and uh, that's not seen to them to be somehow breaking of a precept. It's part and parcel of, of, of how they uh, pursue their spiritual life. And I've always felt that uh, the states of mind in which you can find yourself through the use, the judicious use, let's say, mm. of, um, of psychedelics uh, is a frame of awareness that to me is very close to many of the experiences I have found through meditation and through philosophical reflection. I find that um, these uh, entheogens, as they're sometimes called, these uh, mind-altering substances, if used particularly within the framework of a spiritual practice, uh, can be very, um, can help us towards gaining insight. They can help us towards a kind of uh, affirmation or consolidation of where our life is going. Mm. And in many ways, I think, can be used as, uh, as, as elements of sacred ritual. Mm. And what I did at the age of 60, which is now about five years ago, is that I took a year off and I decided I wanted to revisit my past experiences with uh, psychedelics, but to do so in the context of a religious ceremony, mm. rather than just taking a bunch of pills with some friends in my apartment. And um, this led me to Mexico to take peyote and then subsequently on a couple of occasions in Europe to participate in ayahuasca uh, ceremonies. And I found this enormously bad. Uh, and, um, and again, I, I really, one thing I do want to make very, very clear, I do not believe that just by taking a substance that will make you enlightened or make you more loving or wise. You cannot separate these you know, the, the alkaloids uh, of the substances from the setting and set of your own specific life, your outer life, your inner life. And for someone who's been meditating for 40 years, um, who's developed, you know, quite a uh, you know, well-articulated philosophy of life, to take one of these substances in a ceremonial setting is not really comparable to a 16-year-old kid taking some pill on the street in New York. It, 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 you, you really cannot. So I, I avoid the word drugs in the book. In fact, if you look carefully, the word drug doesn't appear once uh, in the body of the text. And I use instead the word medicine, medication. And I think part of the problem in our culture in talking about these things is we just don't have a language to do so that doesn't carry all sorts of toxic associations. The very word drugs doesn't work for me. It only, it, it's, it's so loaded with associations um, that I prefer simply not to use it and instead to think of, the, of this as a, as, a, as a responsible use of certain kinds of self-medication. Mm -hmm. mm -hmm. And um, yeah, I, I mean, I, the book describes in a way my journey through these um, these plant medicines yep. over a period of about five years, and the book, in a way, is a is, is a, it tells that story. It's an account of, of, of all of that. And as you will know from having read this uh, text, in many ways, it served for me as a kind of purification, mm. a kind of a purging of unhealthy attachments, basically. An unhealthy attachment to alcohol that I have, and an unhealthy attachment to Buddhism. <laughs> <laughs> so um, I am fully aware of the fact that I am I am the first of my generation, as it were, in the position of a teacher who has chosen to come out. But I suspect that there's a, again, it's like we talked about transgression and how I said that my writing is often just giving a voice to people who haven't yet found it for themselves. I have a suspicion that this will be the same here. I think there's a, the, the, there's an, a, a, an underground movements amongst a lot of Buddhists and probably some very senior Buddhists who are exploring these fields, especially in the last few years, there's been a resurgence of the use of psychedelics. Yeah. Uh, and um, I think there's probably a lot more of it going on than the Buddhist community is willing to admit. 
And the, so one of the things I wanted to do is try to flush that out. Mm. But at the same time, I also saw it as another dimension of my work as a writer who seeks to be utterly honest. Mm -hmm. uh, I, I have to acknowledge that in my life as a Buddhist practitioner, the use of, 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 of well, like cannabis primarily um, has been always a, 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 a component uh, element of my thinking and my practice and my reflection and my meditation. I don't see these things uh, as somehow at odds with one another. I think Buddhism is, doesn't really give us much help at all in actually working with this for, these forms of med medication. It's basically, don't do it. Right. It's abstinence. That's the approach, which, you know, in theory is, is um, faultless. Um, yeah, don't, if you don't take any of these things, they won't cause you any harm. That's yeah, true. Yeah. But um, on the other, in practice, it's completely unworkable. unworkable. And um, it always has been that way. I think in Buddhist cult cultures. No. Uh, so I want to bring that out as well. I want to share with people uh, that dimension of my journey. And this is the book in which I've decided to do it. Yeah. Well, my hat is off to you. I respect you so much for being willing to be so transparent. I don't know a single spiritual teacher who doesn't get high. Uh, and yet nobody really talks about it. Um, a lot of them, it's, for a lot of them, it's alcohol. For a lot of them, it's doing, you know, doing psychedelics. Or, or smoking cannabis, uh, and yet there's, so you've dissolved this either or, as you always do, this black white, um, mm -hmm. and this orthodoxy. I feel like you're, you're the most anti-orthodox teacher I know, <laughs> which is such well, a relief. I take that as a great compliment, Mark. Oh, thank it, you. It's meant as one. Let me just ask you one last question, Stephen, which is, yes. when, when you envision a spirituality for the future, can you say a little bit about what that looks like for you um, moving forward? What does it look like? What is a spirituality that incorporates uh, science, that incorporates rationality, that incorporates intoxicants? Look, what would that be? Well, one word I would use is it would be post-creedal. Mm. In other words, it would, be a, it would be a spirituality that's no longer primarily tied to a particular creed. Mm be that the Buddhist creed, the Christian creed, the Jewish creed, the Muslim creed. I think it might be a spirituality in which people find a much greater uh, resource in what goes on between traditions rather than within traditions. I think we, uh, we find ourselves, uh, many of us today, and I'm sure this is true for you, it's true for me, is that I might call myself a Buddhist, but frankly, I spend probably most of my time not in a Buddhist space. I read literature, I watch movies, I take ayahuasca, I do this, I do that. Um, and what I, where I feel most fully alive, where I feel that my life is flourishing, is generally not in a Buddhist space. Uh, but the Buddhist space is the one that has provided me with a kind of sense of rootedness, of groundedness, of discipline, mm. a certain belonging to a tradition, which is all very important. Mm. But the difference to me is that but for me, what is important is to learn to distinguish a team being rooted in a tradition from being stuck in a tradition. Right, right. I think it's very important to be rooted in a tradition. I think you have to have those roots go deep. And I do think for many of us, we need to spend time, years, really getting rooted in, our, you know, in a tradition that really we feel at home. But if we just stay there, and kind of exclude ourselves from everything else, we're stuck in it. Mm. It actually doesn't serve much purpose beyond just giving me a sense of self-security and, and maybe self-worth or position in a community. Mm. So I think the spirituality of the future for me is one that would seek to be more and more rooted in these traditions in order that we can learn to really n negotiate our way through a plurality of traditions. And that, I think, is one of the great richnesses of, of modernity, post-modernity, is that we find ourselves exposed to such an amazing set of resources from all over the world, mm. both secular, religious, and so forth. And this, to me, leads to a notion of spirituality that becomes increasingly in individuated. Mm. I think the Dharma needs to be individuated. Mm. And I'm using that word in the technical sense used by uh, Jung, for example. 
where to be individuated means to differentiate yourself from the collective, from the archetypes, from the, the norms of traditions and, and so forth, in such a way that you become increasingly your own person. That doesn't mean you become an egoist or a sort of an impossibly arrogant person, but it means that you've teased out your potential in such a way that you can optimally flourish to be the person that you aspire to be. And that may have elements of Buddhism or Christianity or socialism or whatever fed into it, but the mix is uniquely your own. It's your own voice that you find. So that to me would be a vision of where we're going, but I'm not naive enough to realize that mass movement religion is probably got a a lot of life left in it yeah. uh, and um, yeah. and often for good reasons i mean if you're living in a very impoverished country with the suppressive government uh, often it's the church maybe an evangelical church that gives you your freedom that gives you your space to and, and so I, I don't want to write these things off because for many people in the world who don't have our privileges yeah. uh, sort of why you know middle-class Europeans or Americans. Uh, these movements have, can be lifesavers, really. They, people need consolation. They need real strong group support. They need the certainties that religion provides to get them out of these situations in which they're trapped. So I don't want to, I'm very reluctant, because otherwise I'd be sort of maybe drawing the blueprint for yet another mass movement. Exactly. <laughs> <laughs> We have to avoid falling into the very traps that we seek to free ourselves from. And that's tricky. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, one of my heroes is Francis of Assisi, mm. who founded the Franciscan Order uh, during his lifetime. And uh, within uh, two or three years before he died, he left it. He was <laughs> sick of it. He, couldn't, he, he, he had to abandon it. Uh, I like that. Uh, that, to me, is a living spirituality. Uh, and... Um, I think I may be, you know, trying to emulate people like him in my work too, uh, is to keep being willing to step outside the comfortable and the familiar in order uh, to respond more authentically to uh, life as it presents itself to us in our day and age. Thank you so much, Stephen. This was so great to talk to you. Well, thank you, Mark. No, it was a, it was a wonderful conversation. And... Um, I hope uh, the listeners uh, find some value in it. And um, as I'm sure Mark will be telling you, this is The Art of Solitude, Yale University Press, published on the 18th of February. Be well, Stephen, and good luck with the book. Thank you.